hello, hello, hello. Okay, awesome people. Today we are going to be talking about... We are going to be talking about American imperialism during the beginning of the 20th century. Somebody has written in the chat here. Let's just see what they said here before we get rocking and rolling. Uh, okay, well, the chat is loading, so hopefully it will load here in a second. Uh, your personal laptop works perfectly, Jackie. So, what we're talking about here, right, is we're talking about the definitions of imperialism, right? And if we're talking about imperialism here in the context of here, we're seeing the development of the United States as an imperialist country, right? It starts out as a baby after the Constitution is signed in 1783, after the Louisiana Purchase, after the Missouri Compromise, after or the beginning of the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, Philippine-American War, right? America continues to get larger and larger, right? Imperialism is when a country takes land or property that does not belong to it for financial or political reasons, usually by force, right? So the United States is founded in 1783, technically. I mean, you could say 1776. Right? This is the Treaty of Paris, right? and the United States continues to get larger and larger and larger. This process of taking land is called, you guessed it, imperialism. So, imperialism is a state policy or a practice or advocacy of extending power and dominion, especially by direct territorial acquisition, so basically taking land or things or places or people, and gaining political and economic control of other areas. So, for instance, right, we're talking about imperialism here, right? If we're talking about imperialism, this is a policy of extending a country's power and influence, right? Now, the United States, the period that we're talking about, becomes imperialistic internationally, right? But let's think about imperialism as taking land from other countries. And remember that during this entire period of manifest destiny and pushing west, the United States was taking land from sovereign territories namely Native American tribes. Once they get to the coast and they run out of land, well, America is going to start taking and acquiring land in the Pacific. That is to control trade in the Pacific and to extend America's sphere of influence. So let's look at the components of imperialism. First, we have what is known as a colony, right? And a colony is a country or area under the full control of another place. So America was once a colony, and then magically, wouldn't you guess it, right? What a surprise. America goes from being a colony to being a colonizer, right? So imperialism, right? There are three components to this equation, right? So imperialism is a system of controlling other countries. The mother country is the country that controls their countries. The mother country that controls those other places. And the places that are controlled called colonies, right? The places that are controlled are called colonies. Okay, so the age of imperialism, right, is from about 1890 to 1920. And this is the period in American history where America begins to expand. What we're talking about here is, again, manifest destiny on an international scale, right? Manifest destiny on an international scale. So we see America, it then becomes a colony, and then America will then become a colonizer. So one of the reasons why America becomes such a prolific force and power during this time period is a book written by Sir Alfred Thayer Mahan called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Right In this book, Alfred Thayer Mahan is going to postulate that if America wants to be, if America wanted to be a world power, it had to have a powerful navy. By controlling the seas, America could control the world. So America is going to start to really prioritize naval capabilities so that the United States can take other lands in, excuse me, Pacific. So what were some reasons why America became expansionist? The first major reason is America had a dire need for raw materials and markets, right? The U.S. is an industrial power, and these new colonies during this time period provide a place for Americans to sell products and to obtain raw products. Secondly, we have strategic reasons, right? These new colonies provide naval strength and they promote American power. Thirdly, 
we have what is known as nationalism, right? Truly, it's the same idea that we saw in Manifest Destiny. People think they are called, ordained by God. They're a superior people or population. So nationalism, we're talking about this colonial expansion that shows the whole world that the U.S. was a great power, right? The Europeans are doing the same thing, and the Americans want to prove they can do it better. And finally, we have attitudes towards other people, right? The Americans believe that Anglo-Saxons are superior. The Americans believe that Anglo-Saxons are better people. And for this reason, they are going to be viewed as people that they think are superior. Uh, so, there were some people who were against imperialism in the United States. Uh, two such notable figures are Mark Twain and our good buddy from the Gilded Age, Andrew Carnegie. So, anti-imperialists write the United States had once been a colony, and people see the moral problems with being an imperialist nation, right? If you are an imperialist country, by the very virtue of your existence, you exist to hurt other countries and take their resources to make yourself better. Right? Anti-imperialists are going to feel that the imperialism that they see there violates the basic democratic values of self-governance that the United States had been founded on. Therefore, right, these people are going to push against these ideas. Next thing I want to talk about here is the Spanish-American War. So, the Spanish-American War was a war between Spain and the United States. It's fought in 1898. Right? The war is fought as an intervention by the United States on behalf of Cuba, right? As a consequence of the United States winning the Spanish-American War, it will acquire the territories of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, and temporary control over Cuba. So, Spanish-American War is between the United States and Spain in 1898. It is fought uh, in Cuba, really. It begins in the harbor, right, of Havana, Hell with Spain, remember the Maine, right? The ship, the United States ship, uh, the USS Maine is sunk, and the United States is going to use this as a rationalization to go to war, right? Uh, then we have a series of sensationalist publications in what is known as yellow journalism, right? And for Pulitzer and Hearst, these people are going to raise paranoia. They're going to make people very scared and believe that things are getting out of control, as a consequence, what this is going to do is it then sets forward uh, a national sentiment that makes people amenable or receptive to war, right? Ultimately, the war is going to end with the Treaty of Paris, and the United States will pass the Platt Amendment, more or less saying that we will not step into Cuba if not needed. However, uh, the United States at this point has pushed itself onto the global stage, de defeating Spain. Right. One person of note here is President Roosevelt, right, uh, as the leader of the Rough Riders and someone who wins the Battle of San Juan Hill, right? He is able to be successful in the Spanish-American War. Uh, so, again, here's Cuba, right? This will become important when we start talking about the Cold War, but it's, a, it's an island about 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So, Cuba, right, is the largest island in the Caribbean Sea. Even before the Spanish-American War, the United States has chosen not to annex Cuba. Cuba does become a protectorate until the passage of the Teller Amendment in 1930. And the United States are going to start to, uh, they are going to start to control this area, right, basically for the purposes of uh, an economic relationship that is exploitative. So, right, the Platt Amendment gives the U.S. the right to intervene in Cuba's business, and the United States will hold control of Cuba after the Spanish-American War until 1930. So, the Spanish-American War gives the U.S. direct control also of Puerto Rico and other areas in the Caribbean Sea, and the United States wants to control these islands for this idea of creating a sphere of influence. This gives them what is known as hemispheric security, right? By controlling all the areas and regions in the Caribbean, this means that the United States now is able to push out any foreign influence. They can push out any foreign influence that allows them to control the region with more, uh, more American intention. 
right? Then for economic interests, right? The Caribbean is full of plantations, right? It's one of the main recipients of slaves for hundreds of years during the triangular trade. So there's a series of plantation economies. Now, while slavery is no longer a thing, the United States wants to exploit the local populations or wants to own their means of producing things because it's highly lucrative and Americans can then sell sugar and things like that. Finally, right, the need for the canal, and we'll talk about this in 1914, right, but the United States is going to set up the Panama Canal, which means that America now, if they control the Caribbean, has the ability to control all seafaring trade that cuts through Central America, right, and because that is going to um, become much more profitable for shipping industries, if America is able to oversee it, it's very financially beneficial. So the Monroe Doctrine, while this happens prior to what we're talking about, it's important because the Monroe Doctrine has to do with this idea, again, of hemispheric security. America wants to keep European powers out of the region. So the Monroe Doctrine is passed in 1823, and it's passed to prevent European nations from establishing new colonies in the Western Hemisphere. Right During this time period, President Roosevelt repeats this warning that he is going to set forward what is known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, basically saying, right, that the United States is going to stop any country that tries to interfere in Latin America. America realizes that it now has the largest military force in the Western Hemisphere, and it is going to prevent Europe from creating any colonies that then they could use to leverage against American strength. So, Right. The Roosevelt Corollary is what is known as this idea of a big stick policy, right? The idea that they're going to constantly threaten other nations to ensure that America is always the predominant military power in the Western Hemisphere. As such, right, America controls the Caribbean, right? And Roosevelt sends troops to Central America to defend U.S. interests, right? We see this image right here. We've got Roosevelt with his big stick controlling the Caribbean Sea, Right, pulling a chain of American ships that are making sure Panama, Mexico, Santo Domingo, Cuba, all these places are following what America wants. This is the big stick policy. Another country that the United States receives after the Spanish-American War is the Philippines. Okay, So the Philippines are a Spanish colony. Right, The United States takes over after the Spanish-American War of 1898. And Filipinos are greatly disappointed with this when the U.S. Congress decides to annex the Philippines instead of granting them their independence. So, Filipinos fight back against the United States. The United States wins the uh, Philippine-American War, and America will turn this area of the Philippines into another protectorate colony. Right? They try to fight for their independence after the Spanish-American War because the Philippines were once controlled by Spain. Okay, Hawaii is this lovely country in the middle of, or lovely, well, at the time, yes, it was a country in the middle of the Pacific. So Hawaii, right, uh, prior to the American military overthrow, Hawaii had large investments of sugarcane and pineapple, right? One of the people that moves in is Sanford B. Dole. He uses a paramilitary force to overthrow Queen Liliuokalani, right? So the United States overthrows the Hawaiian queen, uh, kicks her out of office, and then the United States is now going to control the country of Hawaii. They turn it into a protectorate, into a colony, and then eventually Hawaii will become a uh, Hawaii will become a naval port, and it won't be until the late 1950s when it becomes a state in the United States. Okay, Guam is another Pacific island the United States is going to take during this time period. It is a result of the Spanish-American War. So in 1898, right, Guam is taken from Spain by the United States during the Spanish-American War. So Guam was an important refueling station, and it remains part of the United States today. Right During this time period also, the U.S. pushes into the Midway and Samoa region, where America will also take Midway and Samoa. Okay, so American East Asia, right? Geography had placed the U.S. in a great place for trading with East Asia, 
right? After 1898, right, and the treaty that ends the Spanish-American War, the American government gives new lands to the USA, and now the United States is gaining more territory in the Pacific in order to control trade with East Asia. This gives the U.S. the opportunity to start dealing with Japan and China directly as America controls more islands, right? America has set up all of these bases so that now we can control trade with the two largest economies in Asia, Japan, and China. So with China, we have what is known as the open door policy. So by the 1850s, European nations had already picked up what were known as the spheres of influence in China, right? These spheres of influence were areas where a nation enjoyed special privileges within another nation. As such, right, the U.S. doesn't have a sphere of influence in China, and U.S. Secretary of State John Hay wants to set up a sphere of influence. They want to be able to control what is going on in China. So America will institute what is known as the open door policy, right? Secretary of State John Hay sees China as a great market for U.S. products, and they want to get their sphere of influence, right? We take a look at this image here. <clears throat> we see Russia, Germany, Britain, France, all carving up China. Now America wants part. America wants its slice. It will get that with what is known as the open door policy. So to keep China's markets open to the United States, Secretary of State John Hay announces what is known as the open door policy in 1899, right? This policy gives equal rights to all nations to trade in China. However, it's not exactly equal rights because America bogards its way in with force and we force other countries, right? We control the key to the door to China. America is going to set a precedent that it will be the way for nations to trade with China. So uh, a major reaction to this is the uh, early 20th century Boxer Rebellion. Right. There were Chinese who were against this. Right. This happens in uh, 1900. We'll start to see what is known as the Boxer Rebellion. So by the 1900s, right, the Boxers, these are the Chinese people who uh, oppose the influence of Western nations. They rebel against Westerners living there and they start killing foreigners who are living in China. As a result, the U.S. pushes back from the Boxer Rebellion and crushes it right, to keep China open with trade. And Secretary of State John Hay says that any nation that interferes with the United States, any nation that opposes what America is doing, right, the U.S. will use that rebellion to break up China. Okay, America and Japan, right? So now we're going to talk about Commodore Matthew Perry here. So Japan had been long an isolationist country, only doing some small trading with the Dutch. However, in 1853... American Commodore Matthew Perry is going to move in and open up trade relations with Japan, okay? So, by the 1890s, after the Meiji Restoration, Japan has adopted many Western ways and become Asia's first industrial power, right? Japan becomes Asia's first industrial power. Japan soon becomes an imperialist nation, right? After defeating both China and Russia, uh, Japan wins the 1905... Uh, Russo-Japanese War, and Japan has now become the foremost industrial power. That's one of the reasons why America wants a strong navy, so that they can prevent Japan from controlling the Pacific. Okay. If we take a look at this image right here, this is an incredibly racist image, right? This is America trying to remake the world in the way of the white Anglo-Saxon way. Right, you'll see Uncle Sam is lecturing to the dark-skinned people who look differently than what is a perceived European American. These are a lot of Central American populations, whereas the better-behaved children who are lighter complected are doing what they need to in school. Now we see a Native American who is reading the book upside down, arguing that Native American children have been left alone and are too intelligent to learn. Because of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, they don't allow the Chinese child to even learn and the African-American child is done up in Jim Crow mockery with janitorial duties, right? This is a cartoon satirizing how evil and how ugly this time period was when we're talking about racial nationalism. Okay, Puerto Rico. 
So Puerto Rico is a small island nation in the Caribbean Sea. Right, the U.S. sets up a government for Puerto Rico that is selected by the U.S. president and approved by the U.S. Congress. Therefore, right, Puerto Rico is considered to be a territory of the U.S. and its people have U.S. citizenship. Right, Puerto Ricans control their own internal government, but Puerto Ricans do not have the ability to vote and they don't have representation. So the United States still controls this area still has this area to work as it is and as such, right? But Puerto Ricans are now under the U.S. sphere of influence, but they're not given the full capacity of political and electoral rights to be able to advocate for their own agency, right? Citizens are still not eligible to vote in national presidential elections. Okay, the Panama Canal, right? Here we're talking about Panama here. We're going to talk about the waterway, the man-made river that is cut through Panama that is going to allow the United States to trade more easily after the Spanish-American War. So during the Spanish-American War, right, U.S. warships had to sail 16,000 miles. They had to go all the way around South America to get from one ocean to the other. They had to go from California to Cuba. Panama, however, right, is the narrowest point right, in Central America, and it was the logical place to build a canal, a man-made river. So, at the time, Panama was part of Colombia, right, and, oh gosh, Panama was part of Colombia, which had refused to allow the U.S. to build, right, this canal. They had to go all the way from California all the way around through the tip of South America and into the Caribbean. All right here is Panama as we see right here. What they did is the old route had to go all the way around South America. The new route was much shorter. Okay, so President Roosevelt during this time period, right, President Roosevelt offers the Panamanians independence if they would allow the canal to pass through the Panama Canal zone, right? President Roosevelt is going to use the United States Army to defend Colombians, sorry, to defend Panamanians from Colombians, and this allows the United States, and as a tit-for-tat quid pro quo, the United States is going to get the ability to build a waterway through Panama so people can do trade. Okay. Uh, so, President Roosevelt immediately begins construction of the canal once the United States liberates uh, Panama from Colombia. However, there were major obstacles, right? There's 51 miles of jungle, varying land elevations, right? It takes over 10 years to finish at a cost of 400 million. Right? Uh, frequent rains cause mudslides, tens of thousands of people die, people die to mosquitoes, right? And many people will die to yellow fever. It's an incredibly difficult and violent time period where many people are going to pass away during this time. Right? Here's the Panama Canal. They literally have to blast it open with dynamite and then they work together to create a large waterway. Okay, dollar diplomacy. Right. Dollar diplomacy. Uh, this is a policy used by the President Taft, right? And Taft, instead of using big stick diplomacy, right, as Theodore Roosevelt and others perhaps had, right, uh, instead of using big stick diplomacy, Taft is going to, right, instead of using big stick diplomacy, uh, as Theodore Roosevelt and others had, Taft is going to choose what is known as dollar diplomacy. So dollar diplomacy was using American investment to promote American foreign affairs. This is basically the United States giving out loans that they know 
other people are unable to pay back because they will be not able to, to reimburse for that loan. What this means is the U.S. banks loan Latin American countries so much money that they know these people cannot pay them back all that money, right? And if people can't pay them back all that money, then the United States sends troops forward in order to ensure, right, that these people would be unable to come back during this time period, right? So... Okay, they were still unable during this time period, right, to pay this back. So, for example, if U.S. bankers lend money to Nicaragua, is your dogs? Right. If U.S. bankers lend money to Nicaragua, and Nicaragua has trouble repaying their loan, U.S. bankers would then step in and take whatever is necessary or whatever they possibly could from Nicaragua to ensure right, that they could get paid back their loan. So they would send them a loan they know Nicaragua can't pay for. They would send them a loan that people uh, would be unable to cover. And the idea would be through dollar diplomacy, they're able to come back and take all of these things. So again, to recap here, dollar diplomacy, right? instead of using big stick diplomacy where the U.S. makes threats, dollar diplomacy was used by President Taft. And dollar diplomacy was a system right, used by President Taft, basically set up U.S. loaning money to Latin American banks. The entire idea was that if the U.S. government would send uh, money they knew Latin American countries couldn't pay back. Well, they did that on purpose so they could show up with soldiers and claim things. So, for example, U.S. bankers lend money to Nicaragua. Nicaragua is unable to repay that loan because they gave them a loan they knew they couldn't repay. Then the U.S. bankers are going to send in the U.S. military to take over Nicaragua's railroad system and banks. And this allows the United States to start to to force their way and take things through a different method of imperialism, right? And Taft sends in the Marines. Okay, Woodrow Wilson will be the last, uh, Woodrow Wilson will be the last uh, American progressive president who interferes in Latin America, right? President Woodrow Wilson wants to be seen less as a bully. However, he is going to send in U.S. troops to protect Central American nations and protect American interests. Right, Wilson is largely uh, responsible for what's going on with Pancho Villa, right? In that Mexico has a revolution in 1916, and Woodrow Wilson is going to then refuse to recognize certain separatist groups, right? One of the things that's going to happen here is when Pancho Villa then is also going to claim that parts of the United States should be returned to Mexico, he's going to go on a couple of violent campaigns. And going on violent campaigns, he crosses the border into the United States and kills American citizens who believe that they are defending America, and Pancho Villa claims that is land to Mexico. The United States sends military to go against Pancho Villa, however, Pancho Villa escapes and is never captured. Okay, I realize, right, that some of that was...